Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations at Harvard University. Good evening to those of you joining us here in Boston, and good morning to those, our speakers, and many in our audience joining from Tokyo. We are really excited to bring to you tonight a panel, Japan and Southeast Asia, Power, Politics, and Business. This is a great opportunity for us to feature two of our program affiliates who are the leading experts on the topic of thinking about Southeast Asia. And it's an important time to think about this topic because 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of the diplomatic relations between Japan and ASEAN, the organization that is the leading political structure bringing together the countries of Southeast Asia as a region. And this is a very important region for the world and for Japan, both as a region that has developed through its own context of diplomatic and deep business integration. It has often been contrasted with the more legally institutionalized European form of regionalism. And yet, even if not having the same form of court and commission, ASEAN has built quite a uh, well-established structure for diplomatic and business relations. And ASEAN has also been an important partner for Japan. Most recently, we see the free open Indo-Pacific strategy of the Japanese government that requires close integration with the ASEAN countries. And that builds on the already deep relationships from an FTA with ASEAN that was extended into the comprehensive partnership, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as being engaged in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the spaghetti bowl, noodle bowl of all of the regional free trade agreements that tie countries together. Today, we're going to be talking broadly about how this region looks at economics and politics. We are very honored to bring to you Mia Oba, who is the professor and faculty of law at Kanagawa University and a former academic associate with the program of US-Japan Relations. She was with us at Harvard in the year 2006-2007. Oba Sensei specializes in the study of regionalism in East Asia. She's written many books on the topic from Asia Taiheyo Chiiki Keisei e no Michinori, The Invention of the Asia Pacific Region, and this book won the Okita Masayoshi Memorial Prize, as well as the Okita Commemorative Award. She has also written in 2015, in 2014, the book Juso Teiki Chiki Toshite no Asia, the multi-layered world region of Asia. In 2015, she received the prestigious Yasuhiro Nagasone Award. We are also very happy to welcome another one of our former associates, Nobihiro Hemi, who is the chief strategist and partner at Monitor Deloitte and is a former associate from the program during the year 2016 to 17. He is a leading member of Deloitte's global business intelligence chain. He is an expert in strategic planning and business model development in a multinational environment. Before joining Deloitte, he worked for the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. And he has also been a World Economic Forum Fellow. Along with advising businesses, he has also found time to write a book, which is truly impressive. He is the author of China ASEAN no Shogeki, China Asian Impact, the Economic Megazone on Japan's Doorstep, which came out from Nikkei Business Publications in 2021 and has been the number one best-selling business book in international affairs in Japan. Hemizan develops a fascinating argument in this book about the importance of ASEAN at the crossroads, showing how this region is especially resilient in the face of shocks, whether those are from natural disasters, disease, or geopolitical tensions. Well, certainly there is much for us to learn from how ASEAN navigates the difficulties. And we are glad to have with us two experts to explain this important region. Our event tonight is co-sponsored by the Harvard University Asia Center. And I'd like to start off with uh, Oba Sensei as our first speaker. We'll have each speak and then open up for questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, thank you for your introduction. So uh, Christina, and uh, thank you for 
uh, inviting me to this very interesting uh, seminar, a uh, webinar. So I'm so glad to uh, have opportunity to talk. So about the Japan uh, Southeast Asian relationship uh, to the to the audience today. I really want to thank to the, all the audience, all the, uh, the participants so in the seminar. So, and then, so I would uh, like to start my uh, uh, presentation. I know, so I have only 20 minutes, so for my presentation. So, and then, so um, I ready uh, many slides for the presentation today, but so I will skip, so some of them. So I'd like to share slide now. Well, uh, change and change or the relationship between the Japan and ASEAN or the ASEAN countries and the direction of the new partnership. So this is a, a very a, a little bit long uh, title today, but so I'd like to review the changes of the relationship between the Southeast Asia and Japan and then Japan's diplomacy towards Southeast Asia. The, at first, so at first, so I have to mention that the Japan, so especially the post-war Japan, still have a very big ne negative legacy. So because of the its southern world expansion during the World War II. So everybody know that so Japan so deployed or Japan the army and navy deploy the Southeast Asia during the World War II, but Japan were defeated. And then so in the post-war Japan and for the post-war era, Japan have to uh, construct the uh, the establish the diplomatic relationship with the Southeast each Southeast Asian country. So by providing reparations and economic cooperation to them. So such a reparation and economic cooperation were the origin of the Japan's ODA, so to Asia. And so as after that, Japan expanded that year or an ODA to the world. So, and then, so at the beginning of the Japan ASEAN relationship, so you know that uh, the ASEAN was established. So in the 1967, so uh, in the mid of the Vietnam War, but at that time, Japanese policy makers or the intellectuals, so evaluation on, on the ASEAN was so low. So nobody expected so, so much so to the, the ASEAN because so from the Japanese point of view, so ASEAN is a mere as a mere the coalition of the small countries. So in the Southeast Asia, and in addition to that, so at that time uh, in Japanese society, the leftist the intellectuals influence is very predominant. That from their point of view, ASEAN is a kind of the anti-communist alliance as well as a tool of the US imperialism. And then so the, the Japanese society and Japanese policy makers, intellectuals, evaluation on the, uh, on the uh, ASEAN was so low at the time. But so Japan had, had to open the negotiation or the dialogue with the ASEAN because so uh, the, in, the, in the early 1970s, so the trade friction, trade economic friction between the, uh, the, the one of the ASEAN countries, Malaysia and Japan occurred. And then so uh, the ASEAN and the Japan have to so uh, negotiate over the such a uh, such a trade friction on the synthetic labor issue and uh, synthetic labor. So for the Japan side, the starting point of the as and uh, Japan ASEAN relationship was not so happy, so rather unhappy one. But after that, so uh, the, so in the in the early 1970s, not only the trade friction over the synthetic labor, so the very strong antipathy towards Japan 
So it uh, uh, was rising. So in the Southeast Asia. So because so from the Southeast Asian side, Japan was Japan or Japanese was perceived as economic animals, or the, the some many Southeast Asian countries people so they got it the Japanese economic expansion in the Southeast Asia as a revival of the imperialism. So and then so as uh, for example, so when the uh, Prime Minister Takue Tanaka visit visited to the Southeast Asia in the January to uh, 1974, so the very strong and very big riot occurred. So riot against uh, Japan so occurred in the Indonesia and the Thailand. So at that time, so Japan uh, facing the very hard hard time. So in terms of the relationship between the Southeast Asia and Japan, and Japanese policymaker had to reconstruct the, the, its diplomacy towards uh, uh, Southeast Asia. So at that time, so Prime Minister Fukuda uh, delivered the speech. So in Manila in the 1977, uh, the, the Fukuda, Fukuda mentioned the three pillars so of the and the, and the three pillars of the principles of the japanese new uh, uh, uh diplomacy towards the southeast asia first one is that japan will never gain never uh again be the military power the second one is uh, japan uh tried to advance the dialogue or the heart to heart or the heart and the mind relationship with the Southeast Asia. And the third one is that Japan tried to accomplish the equal partnership. And so Japan would be the bridge between the ASEAN and the Indochina countries at that time. So and after that, these three pillars uh, were wrapped up as the Fukuda doctrine. So the, the the announcement of the Fukuda doctrine have a, a little and uh, have a positive impact of the relationship between the Southeast Asia and Japan. And after that, the Japan ASEAN partnership became a significant part of the Japan's policy towards Southeast Asia. And so I I'd like to mention that at that time. So Japan Joe and enjoyed the very advantageous so position. So especially especially in the economics the, from the 1970s to 1990s. So for example, Japan is uh, the latest trading partner of the ASEAN countries, and Japan was the top donor of the ODA to Southeast Asia, and. So after the Plaza Accord in the 1985, Japanese companies so provided and provided a huge amount of the investment in the Southeast Asia. And then so uh, Japan was the center of the East Asian uh, economic integration so from the 1980s and 1990s. So Japan, the Japanese government so could so transformed such an uh, advantageous position of the economy into the, its the political so leverage towards the Southeast Asia. So in 1990s, uh, 1980s and the 1990s. And then so in the 1990s, so Japan announced the many and uh, announced the enhanced the, the, uh, the cooperation, economic cooperation between the Japan and ASEAN. For example, so Japan and ASEAN launched uh, the started the ATM Medi so in the 1992, and after the uh, Asian financial crisis, Japan proposed the Asia Military Fund, the I mean, and, and, uh, Asia, Asia Military Fund idea in the 1997. And unfortunately, this idea so, was not accomplished. But instead of that. Japan uh, succeeded in the setting the, the, the new the new Miyaza plan. So in the 1998 and 1999. So and then so the on the basis of the new uh, new Miyaza plan, Japan 
so has a, 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 a the took a very initiative role so for establishing if the establishment of the Chennai initiative this is a financial uh, uh, cooperation in the east uh, uh, east asia so uh, in the 2001 and then so but Unfortunately, so Japan had to and had to deal with the new realities. So in the 2000s, so at the time, so Japan for Japanese policy making circle related to the Asian policy began to be obsessed by the competition with the rising China. The since the 2000, since the early 2000s, so and. So in addition to that, of course, so China, Chinese economy is growing. So, but in addition to that, Southeast Asian countries and, and are also the developing the, during the 2000s. And so the Japan had to add the new element in the policy toward Southeast Asia and ASEAN. So uh, the, and, and because, so ODA still the very important dip diplomatic tool for Japan, but so it's not sufficient because the Southeast Asian countries themselves are very, very developing. And the so Brunei and the Singapore reached the high level, high level economic and economic income country. And then so Japan could not provide so the ODA to them, you know, and, and, and to them. And so the other ASEAN countries also developing, and so their demand for the to the ASEAN to the to Japan was changing, and then so Japan began to have to show its initiative, so the, by uh, using another another tool. So one of the very good tool is uh, Japan's initiative to the regional integration. Uh, and encouraging ASEAN centrality, so with a tightening of the tie with the ASEAN. So Japan promoted promoted the FTA with uh, with the ASEAN, and so Japan proposed the idea of the East Asian Community as well as the comprehensive economic partnership for the East Asia sphere, and so Japan. So tried to emphasize the importance of the uh, ASEAN centrality the, since the, since the, uh, to 2000. And so in the 2000 and then as soon as the ten, the Japan have to have to so uh, promote uh, the more so more uh, 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 Japan have to add uh, have to add the new element, so further new element to the uh, its diplomacy toward the Southeast Asia. So because in the 2010s, the rise of China became more obvious and visible. So and uh, so we are facing the change of a balance of power between the US and China. And so Japan's proactive foreign policy was also obvious. So for example, so China's assertive stance over the territorial issues, especially in the East, East China Sea and the South China Sea are so uh, obvious. And so uh, the China's proposed and uh, proposed so new, uh, new regional international order ideas like the AIIB and BRI. So from, and from and the, against this back, the backdrop, so for Japan, the partnership with Southeast Asian country was becoming more significant than before from a viewpoint of the political and security concern. So before that, Japan's the pillar of the Japan's cooperation with ASEAN was the economy. So economic cooperation so was uh, the very significant pillar. So of course, so until now, Economic cooperation with the Southeast Asia was a very important pillar for Japan. But in addition to that, in the 2010, Japan tried to promote so security and defense cooperation with the Southeast Asia. 
And, uh, and unfortunately, so in 2000, and 2000, 2000 and 2010, Japan's economic uh, power had been declining, had been declining in Asia. So I, 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 have, I have no time to explain deeply, but so please check them after that. And so as I mentioned before, so ODA was of course a very important tool for us, but it's not sufficient to, to not sufficient for the uh, diplomacy toward the Southeast Asia. And so um, the now so against the backdrop, so Japan's diplomacy and the policy toward Southeast Asia is shifting. So in addition to the ODA. Japan had to foster other measures to keep and foster the partnership with the ASEAN and ASEAN country to sustain the existing free, open, and rule-based regional order. So, and then, so the, the in, from this point of view, the importance of the security defense aspect of the Japan-ASEAN partnership began to be emphasized in the Japanese foreign policy. So for example, so national security strategy in the 2013, so mentioned that like that, the Republic of the Korea, Australia, ASEAN country and India are the shares and then are the partner because so they share the universal value and so the strategic interest. And so, so we have to, we Japan have to strengthen the cooperation, the cooperative relationship. And so the, in 2014, the Japan ASEAN informal defense minister meeting was established. And so in the 2016, Japan proposed Venture Vision, which, con and con uh, which contains uh, many elements of the defense cooperation towards Southeast Asia from Japan. And so Japan upgraded this uh, uh, vision to, uh, in, in, uh, into the and up to the uh, Vientiane region 2.0 in the 2019. So, and so Japan positioned the ASEAN-Japan partnership within the context of the diplomacy of the free and open in the Pacific FOIP. And after the banner of the FOIP, so the FOIP, Japan tried to many cooperation towards, uh, towards Southeast Asia and the ASEAN countries. So some of them are very economic uh, ones. So for example, the quality infrastructure or the quality infrastructure is a typical one. But so on the other hand, Japan emphasizes so the importance to ensure the maritime stability. So in the, in the FOIP and then so providing equipment on the human resource development for the maritime law enforcement in the Southeast Asia and the provision and the Japan provide, provided the total of the 27 patrol vessel, so 13 high speed boat and 11 coastal monitoring radar equipment to the coastal countries in the Southeast Asia. So it's a, it's a part of the examples. So the uh, Japan's defense and, and security cooperation towards Southeast Asia. So my point is that, so Japan began to emphasize the importance of the security and the defense cooperation towards Southeast Asia. And then, so I skipped through them. And so, but uh, uh, the, so unfortunately, so Japan and uh, Japan and ASEAN interest are not only coincide, coincide. So uh, the, the rather, so there are the, uh, some gap. So between them. So of course, as Sino US strategic competition in the in the Pacific intensifies and the regional order shift, Japan and ASEAN are on the same position. So because so uh, we we both of them so not easily can take only one side between the US and China. So because so for, so, so Japan is a, a ally of the United States, but on the other hand, China is a very important neighbor for us and economic partner. 
So, so for Japan, it's very hard to completely take side, whether they take one side between the US and China. So the, the Southeast Asia is also. So, and then, so uh, the for, for both, so Japan and ASEAN, so try to um, encourage the strategic autonomy. So um, autonomy, so all the ASEAN and ASEAN country is very critical. So, but however, there seem to be very serious gap between Japan and ASEAN. Japan intended, in, in, uh, Japan intention is that ASEAN and ASEAN country have, have been so important themselves, but in the current strategic circumstances in the East Asia and the Winter Pacific, how to address the expansion of the China's influence is Japan's top priority. In this context, Japan tried to further tighten the tie with ASEAN as a partner. But on the other hand, China, and, uh, sorry, so ASEAN's stance is very ambivalent. So ASEAN countries try to keep the balance and not to take, side, take one side in the greater power rivalry. So they can't totally support and accept the current approach of the and Japan. So uh, the ally of the US with the FOIP. So I think, so Japan's, Japan share the same position with uh, uh, the ASEAN. So intrinsically, so, but on the other hand, Japan's foreign policy is tilting to the, uh, the coalition with the G7 and the US now. And so from this point of view, Japan tried to, to pull the ASEAN to be a partner, the good partner with, and with Japan and the United States. So at least from the ASEAN side, so the, the Japan's so behavior is perceived like that. So, but it's a, it's a very uh, serious contradiction with uh, uh, the ASEAN, so multi-dimensional, then multi-directional foreign policy towards all of the great power around the, uh, Southeast Asia. Anyway, so yes, the conclusion is that, so Japan is more concerned about the challenges against the existing rule-based regional order in, in the Pacific and regard ASEAN country as a crucial partner to sustain it. From this point of view, security and defense cooperation is becoming more important. Of course, economic cooperation is still very important, So, but security and defense element was added so to the partnership between the ASEAN and Japan. So, however, their perception and interest do not already coincide, and there is a serious gap. So, Japan needs to strengthen the partnership deliberately, always taking into account the ASEAN's prosperity to, man and to maintain its strategic autonomy. That at the last, so I would like to briefly uh, inter inter and introduce, so explain the brief explained about the expert panel for the 15 years of the ASEAN Japan friendship and the cooperation uh, from the May and the last year, uh, in the last year. So I was the uh, uh, chairperson of the, this, this uh, expert panel. So the, uh, so the, this year, so 2023 was the 15th anniversary years of the Japan ASEAN partnership. And then so Japanese government will announce the new direction of the partnership between the ASEAN and Japan at the, at the end of this year. And then so before that, the Japanese government set the expert panel, so which recommended the, the new direction of the uh, new partnership so um, between the ASEAN and Japan. So uh, the, we, we, can, uh, we already submitted the report to the government. And so, so we can get the report in the website, Japanese government website. And then, so if you interest the report, the content of the report, please access to the, uh, the website of the Japanese foreign, uh, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so, thank you very much. Great, that was wonderful. Both the 
historical evolution of this important relationship and consideration okay. about next steps forward. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Nobu Hemi with your presentation. Hi, uh, good evening, and <laughs> uh, good morning, and the Tokyo audience, and uh, good evening, the uh, US audience. And uh, thank you very much and uh, for inviting me and such an honorable and uh, presentation and a panel and Q and a session. Thank you, and Christina Davis professors and uh, Fujihira Sensei and the faculty of US Japan program at Harvard Universities. So uh, my name is Nobu Henmi, and I usually work for the uh, strategy consulting firm and uh, monitor Deloitte. Uh, in Tokyo, but they're traveling a lot around the world, you know, uh, US, UK, or in the Southeast Asia as well. Uh, since the uh, Japanese government opened the uh, COVID policies uh, last year, so I met the uh, uh, Christina and Dwight, uh, the uh, in in US and Fujiro Sensei as well. So uh, uh, I have the work for the uh, public and uh, institution and. Uh, um, and private companies and strategic consulting firm. And uh, so my work has been and uh, mainly focusing on uh, business strategy and economic and diplomacy in uh, Asia, but uh, uh, bringing and the US perspectives and UK's perspective together. So uh, as a practitioner, uh, I hope uh, my and today's presentation and my topic will be helpful to all of you. So uh, I'd like to and uh, talked about the, you know, what Asia was like and after the pandemic mainly. Um, uh, in particular, I'd like to talk about the relationship between um, uh, Southeast Asia, ASEAN and China. This is the China ASEAN. So and my and today's topic is uh, kind of upgraded version of the, my book and the China ASEAN after the pandemic. So uh, finally, and uh, if I the time permit, um, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about what Japan should do in this context or in the Q1 session. So this is the storyline. So uh, today's key agenda is why is the China Sen is a spotlight right now? And this is the first agenda. And our second agenda is the uh, how about the relation between China and ASEAN evolves. And but the uh, uh, Oba Sensei has and uh, touched it on a little bit, but uh, I will add the you know, China side and uh, in this my presentation. And what are the and finally what are the tips and the perspective in this region? This might be discussed in a Q and a session uh, if and part time permits. So uh, due to the time and the constraint, in the the answer and the conclusion is like this. The and uh, first of all, uh, the emergence of the uh, economic mega zone. China ASEAN. This is a very important and uh, perspective to understand in this region. So during and after the pandemic, China and ASEANs are expected to grow faster than the global economy. This is the end uh, uh, expected from the IMF and the statics and the World Economic Outlook. And the, uh, these two regions will be and uh, you know gain the strong and the economic and uh, uh, growth. Uh, by at least by 2024. And the second point is the China ASEAN economic integration has accelerating and during the COVID-19 till now, maybe and this year and the next year will be much stronger than before. And the China ASEAN scenario would be realized even after the post-COVID world. This is the first message. The second point, a key perspective to observe the China ASEAN mega zone. So I have I would like to, you know, um, uh, mention three important points. What is the, uh, the perspective of regional cooperation between China and ASEAN, and especially focusing on city to city basis, you know, and a connection, interaction. This is the important and the perspective, and also and infrastructure development with regional player with the digital power. This is a real economy. Uh, real and business, what is currently happening between China and the Southeast Asia, ASEAN. And finally, the uh, emergence of regional companies in China, ASEAN, like uh, an ASEAN conglomerate is expanding to mainland of China. And also Chinese company is coming to ASEAN. These and uh, transactions making the China, ASEAN, mega zone economy and much stronger than before. 
this is a key message I'd like to deliver. And uh, uh, for facing this kind of things, and uh, what and the Japan or and the global West should do, and uh, what we can learn from the impact and the lesson of the China ASEAN megazone to the world. So first question is how to build the Japan and the global West law in the age of new Asian centuries. And a second and a question is how to develop resilient supply chain. As Oba Sensei mentioned, security issues right now and in the Asian region is a hot topics. So for the business side, and the resilient supply chain is a big and uh, um, issue concern and how to develop and how to balance political and uh, you know uh, security issues and uh, business and economic benefit. That the uh, uh, resilient supply chain is you know and a key hot topics to understand and China ASEAN and the mechanism. And finally, how about the Japanese next strategies to rebuild in this region? So for policy level, that might be okay. However, in a business level, uh, we have been and uh, you know uh, constructed a big footprint in the Southeast Asia and also China. However, thinking about new and business models coming, such as digital and life science or security issues, we need to thinking about redevelop a new and business model. That might be a key question and to discuss in the Q and session. This is a summary. So I'd like to and start from the uh, slide. So uh, this slide in the page five and it shows and uh, uh, the survey from ISEAS. ISEAS is the uh, uh, Singapore's and the think tanks and uh, they surveyed uh, every year and uh, the relation between ASEAN and other regions and including China and the US and the other and the topics. But again, yeah, every year, and ESEAS and surveyed and economic influence of you know and uh, uh, from China uh, or you know in Asia other Asian countries. The, the, this question is always you know and picked up in every years. And uh, this and the survey was announced four weeks ago. I was a little bit surprised. Uh, please look at in you know, China's and uh, you know and a point there and a point has dramatically dropping down more than the point, 10 point as compared with last years. By looking at only this, maybe it might be misleading. People might think, oh, oh this might be in China's, you know, and a zero COVID policy or the security concerns from ASEAN side will affect on this. However, the story is not such a simple and, uh, uh, and a single and, uh, you know, um, uh, situation. So when we look at the end, uh, you know, global economic and the scenario and from IMF and the red line is China and the green is, you know, um, ASEAN five. And uh, with compared to the end, uh, world economic growth, still ASEAN five and China is, and, you know, and surpassed, you know, global average growth rate in 2023 and 2024. So they have been, uh, you know, a powerful engine for the global economy still. Of course, in uh, China and uh, um, uh, slipped down in uh, last year due to the uh, strong and zero COVID and policy. However, their economic growth might be an expected in this year and um, the year after as well. So, and uh, those two region and countries and might be an uh, you know, engine for the global economies. And uh, looking at and the China and ASEAN's relations, this chart, uh, this graph, and especially on the right side is really interesting. In 2018, this is the end, this statics from the China side and trading partners. So number one partner in 2018 and five years ago was EU. Then number two was US. So ASEAN was number three. However, ASEAN is ranking up every year since 2018. And in 2019, ASEAN ranked number two. And finally, 2020, and ASEAN became top one, uh, number one and trading partner for in China. Even in the uh, during the uh, COVID situation, ASEAN maintains 
you know, and a number runs and a priority as a trading partner for China. So checking the uh, calculating the CAGR compound annual growth rate basis from 2019 to 2020, ASEAN achieved double digit growth annual basis, 15% growth, while EU is 6%, US is you know, 11, and Korea 8%, Japan is 4%. So anyway, the uh, ASEAN's and the China's, ASEAN and the China's and the relationships, it's you know, amazing. And looking at the left side, an FDI from China to ASEAN, ASEAN to China is also growing, especially to China to ASEAN and from 2019 to 2021, it's growing more around 20%. And from ASEAN to China, it's around 15%. So, and trading volume is around 70%. So this is amazingly, you know, tightened, you know, their and economic relation. That is currently happening. So, and the backing and the, uh, you know, ECS and the stories. So, and uh, ASEAN people say, oh, China's and their economic influences is dropping down. However, the reality is not like that. This is the official statics from China, st China side. And from the ASEAN side, maybe and the situation might be same. So um, uh, when we're talking about in the East Asia and the Southeast Asia and the regions, we tend to and talking about an ASEAN's autonomy, like a Japan and ASEAN relation, and a Japan and China relations. And sometimes maybe and this and the type of you know, perspective might be applied to global West side, like a US China and the US ASEAN. However, I would like to emphasize it of China ASEAN towards Japan, China ASEAN and US, and China ASEAN and Global West. That perspective is much more important to do the business, especially. So, and uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, China ASEAN city strategies. As I mentioned, and the city, and, uh, and the city and the city relation is very important to understand China ASEAN and the mega zone economies. And I'd like to start from China side because in the Oba Sensei mentioned in ASEAN uh, already. So, and for China, looking at the slide, yeah, this slide, left side, and the uh, uh, dark green, it's around the Shanghai area, coastal area is you know highlighted which means the um, uh, size of the economy the eastern side and the southern side of the china is you know richer than other cities people is always talking about china's and the slowdown one china story however by breaking down in a province level the story is completely different and life side is the uh, uh, growth rate of each and major and provinces of china especially Canton, southern part of China. Uh, Canton and the province has been growing and uh, for and uh, 12 percent for, for over the last and uh, 20 years. And while and uh, Tianjin is a little bit slowing and uh, recently. And uh, Beijing and the uh, um, growth is limited. And uh, Shanghai is you know getting matured. So uh, thinking about you know uh, this and uh, um, figures, uh, we cannot and uh, talking about and one China it's and sometimes especially for the business and the economic situation is misleading. I'd like to talk a little bit more. And the Chinese and the central government and the setting up and the famous and the five years plan and uh, uh, now and they are uh, trying to take fifteen. 15th and five years and a plan, and the body of former and 14th and five years plan and defines 19 and city clusters. And especially and the level one and the five and the mega city is very much important to understand and the Chinese and the inner powers. And the famous and the mega zone is number one and Shanghai mega zone, Yangtze River Delta mega city clusters. And a Greater Bay Area is a Canton area, number two. And now, in the western part of China, 
like a Chengdu, a Chongqing area, number four, is getting and the bigger and the bigger. And amazingly, each this and the, you know, and five mega city clusters have more than five and uh, more than 100 million population, which means they have at least the uh, five Japan and the, you know, population inside the, in the mega city level. This is a very important, you know, lesson to understand and to the business. So for the, and the business and side, and uh, these and the five major city is competing each other. This is very important. When we're talking about China risk, China is, you know, um, uh, uh, taking, you know, very important and, uh, you know, technology or, you know, uh, digital and economy from a global west side or something like that. However, the, actually the situation is much more complex. Each, Mega zone cluster has different type of the you know, characteristic. Of course, they have, you know, all and five and the mega zone have bio and pharma and the industry. However, um, like uh, you know, number one, Shanghai economic zone have everything. However, number four, like the western part of you know, China, and focusing on railway and transit equipment investments. And, and the pharma and the life science technologies. And the, the southern part is focusing on ACEH and the smart manufacturing, electric panel, and functionally and the material, which is going to be an advanced material. So this might be uh, you know, um, uh, issues when we're talking about and the security and the economic and the security issues. This part, GBA and the Yansen River Delta has you know, um, uh, uh, integrated circuit, semicon and uh, functional uh, material. They have this kind of, and uh, you know, um, uh, uh, industries, but the other part, they do not have such kind of capability. So we need to carefully check about when we are talking about and the library, this mega zone, rather than focusing on overall China. This is a very important, you know, um, perspective to understand the China. So these and the five and clusters is linking to an ASEAN. This is what I want to and, uh, uh, send the messages. Now, before talking about you know, the linkage between you know, ASEANs, I'd like to and uh, touching on how big this and uh, you know uh, mega and five and uh, cities and sizes. For example, Shanghai Yangtze River Delta economic clusters ranked number eight. When we and uh, uh, counted as uh, you know and world and the GDP rankings, their sizes between you know, France and the economy, uh, France and Italy's economies, so they are in a super big you know an economic zone. Number two, GBL region is almost same size of you know, Mexico's and the GDP size. So maybe you can easily understand how big this and uh, economic size is, you know. And other city is like, you know, um, you know, um, really big, like number three is uh, almost the same as Netherlands. So, and uh, uh, by breaking down in GDP per capita basis, income basis per person, the situation is much more uh, serious and much more, you know, um, hard to understand for a uh, global rest and also and uh, Japanese people as well. Uh, this survey in 2015 is conducted by and uh, um, uh, Japan Center for Economic Researches. So based on this and the figures and our and uh, group and uh, calculated the scenario, how it's going to be. And then by mixing and the GDP data the GDP scenario, something like that. So amazingly, and in the former um, uh, eight years ago, Japanese big city was in the top rank. It's yellow, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, Fukuoka. Then, and the Chinese and the mega city follows. And after that, ASEANs and mega cities follows. This was a priority in the before. However, what about the futures? For example, 20 and uh, 30, in seven years, only Nagoya, Tokyo remains. However, uh, the Shenzhen, Nanjing, and Chengdu, and we surpassed and Osaka and Wuhan, Beijing, 
maybe surpassed in Fukuoka. Even in Jakarta, central Jakarta, will surpass in the Fukuoka. And of course, I understand the, uh, uh, there could be uh, some you know, um, argument how to calculate this survey. However, and uh, I can, and we can clearly say, and this situation is and uh, changing dramatically and our perception between ASEAN and China. We are calling, and this phenomena is the rich cities in emerging countries. This is the emergence. This is our and catch copies. So uh, we are always and tend to thinking about nation to nation and perception when we're talking about in the, this regional and economic ties. However, uh, we'd like to, I'd like to, you know, focusing on the importance of region to regions and, uh, you know, um, uh, cooperation and also city to city and cooperation. That is very important, you know, and the perception. For example, this is the uh, um, uh, images of the slide. Uh, normally, uh, we are uh, thinking nation to nation. However, the business is happening in a city to city because as I have explained, when we look at the uh, GDP per capita and the ASEAN and the Chinese and uh, you know, mega city has been and growing and uh, faster and uh, they are uh, producing a new business model. So doing the business, we need to have a city to city, you know, understanding. And at the same time, and the region to region and framework is also important. As an over sensei and uh, uh, Davis, Professor Davis mentioned IPF or in you know, a FOIP, and it's a regional framework. But a China ASEAN is a kind of, you know, they have already an FTA. However, and also, and when we're talking about IPF, this is a horizontal integration kind of. While in a China ASEAN is a vertical integration, you know, northern part is a China and you know, and vertically integrated in the ASEAN. This is their kind of scopes. We need to understand how to mix the balance, vertical integration, the horizontal horizontal integration in this and economic orders. And when we're talking about this issue, the so global order is very in you know, a high level issue. So we need to pay much attention to region to region and perspective much more than that. And uh, uh, when I worked for the uh, uh, public sectors, the uh, department was divided into a uh, nation level or the region level. However, they are not exchanging a lot of information like uh, uh, Department of Asia. They have East you know, Asia division uh, uh, unit. Uh, for example, it's China, and the Southeast Asia unit is ASEAN. South Asia, South Asia unit is India, but they do not exchange the idea, and also they do not have a regional and uh, you know and a function and operation department within the company or you know and the government. That is a kind of you know um, misleading the point and to understand what is currently happening in this region. That's the blind spot. However, uh, Asians and uh, you know company, especially Southeast Asian company, is really powerful. Even in the nation level, for example, Singapore is one of the best cases. They are taking advantages of understanding how to leverage region to region and city to city and strategy and the policies. They are exporting, and Singapore is easier and very famous, but yeah, the population size is less than you know, 9 million. It's a very and a small country, but they are and a city country. So they are trying to you know, export their knowledge and uh, uh, mixing their and the city and the complexity, and develop, developer and the constructor and the healthcare businesses, finance and infrastructures. They are targeting you know, pinpoint in the mainland of China. First of all, Suzhou in 1994, then after they are targeting Tianjin, now they are targeting Chongqing, western part of China. They are not targeting overall China. They are targeting number one or number two cities by and leveraging of their capability. That is one of the, uh, you know, essence, you know, uh, what they can do, you know, and uh, um, 
also, and we can learn from them. In order to and, allow some discussion, if you could try to wrap up in a couple more minutes. Right, 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 right. right. And I was and finish, and uh, you know this slide, and the uh, region to region and the connectivity. And uh, in the past, from uh, western part of and uh, China to uh, Southeast Asia, it takes uh, more than one month. However, now they are using expressway, and they are um, uh, reaching just uh, two or three days for shipping the goods and the services. So now we can have the discussion. I'm sorry, Christine San, you know, um, you know my end presentation is, you know, stop it. And we'd like to and continue our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was fantastic. I think as scholars of international relations, we always think state to state and it's refreshing and eye-opening to hear you. I think from the business perspective, city to city is a new and important uh, way of engaging. I would like to open up to some questions. I know there's quite a few online and first we're going to start one of our associates, So Morikawa, who is assistant professor at the Department of Civil Engineering for the University of Tokyo has a question. Morikawa sensei, would you like to lead off? Yes, thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Owa-san and Hemi-san for the very interesting presentation. So um, as we see from the presentation today, so uh, the shared landscape uh, in both um, political and economic context is the, uh, obviously the rise of Chinese presence in recent uh, decades. So uh, keeping this background in mind, I'd like to ask uh, both of you to elaborate uh, more, a little more about the, some heterogeneity or difference inside the you know, Asian. I mean, the, among the uh, Asian uh, member countries. So I think uh, the, there could be a logical politics and that there could be a logical business. And that I, I would like to know the, how the lo these logics are shared or not. So I'd like to ask uh, both of you about the, uh, in terms of uh, you know, relationship with China, there are, whether there are some heterogeneity or difference among the member countries or may maybe the cities in Asia, uh, sorry, Asia. Thank you very much. Why did you start off, Oba Sensei? Yes, okay. So, yeah, ASEAN so composed, uh, is composed of 10 member countries. So, of course, the and each country has uh, each own and uh, their own interest and uh, perspectives towards China, of course. But so I think so. I mean, so we can divide the, the ASEAN country into two, two, two groups. The first one is uh, uh, the country which have uh, many choices, not only China. So like uh, India and Malaysia and Thailand. The other, the other group is uh, uh, the countries which uh, did have, uh, have no choice other than China, so like uh, Laos. So, and then, so it differs, but on, but on the other hand, all of the ASEAN countries are very concerned about their autonomy. So, and then, so in this, in, 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 in this point, so their interests are, co are converged. So they tried to, uh, how they tried to keep their autonomy, but on the other hand, so the, in reality, the, the, the level of the, uh, independent dependence and independence of the China is different. This is my uh, answer to you. So, how about how do you think about Hemi Sensei? <laughs> Thank you very much for the uh, Oba Sensei. And uh, my and uh, basic understanding is the same as the uh, Oba Sensei. However, the, I would like to touch you on the business side. And uh, you know, can you hear my voice? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, now the situation has been changing slightly. And for example, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, LCM, and, on, and formerly an LCM V, Vietnam, uh, has gaining the power and as, uh, as compared to before. And now in the Philippines, the, uh, the reason why is the, they are and having and, uh, uh, geographical and benefits. You know, uh, Cambodia has an ex, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, sipping on the time and also critical mineral. And the Philippines and the Indonesia has a nickel. You know, they are you know, exporting, they have the strong power and you know, to export. They have the mining 
which they, China do not have. So China need to, you know, um, you know uh, give some incentive much more than before, you know, to these uh, countries. So the level of the uh, each country's and the economic situation is completely different. However, the bargaining power has been slightly changing. So uh, uh, I think um, uh, former discussion like uh, China and ASEAN, you know, and uh, power balance is now shifting more, you know, uh, like uh, hedging and balancing, you know, uh, relationship. This is my understanding from business side. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting because I'm studying the uh, the infrastructure development in the. Asian countries. So in that sense, it's like some of the you know, Laos are depend dependent on Chinese uh, you know, investment, but maybe the, in recent years, the situation could be you know, somewhat slightly changed uh, in terms mm -hmm. of business perspective. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, Hemi Sensei's mention is very, in very interesting even for me. So because from the business side, I thought, so the, the power balance is very, uh, is I think, the power balance between the ASEAN and China is very obvious because many media coverage uh, the, tend to focus on the gap, power gap between the ASEAN and uh, China. So, but uh, according to the Hemi Sensei, Hemi San, so the power balance between the ASEAN and the China is shifting and changing. So the 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 rather the ASEAN countries can the gain is bargaining power against the China. So is that is this a correct? Um, uh, now it's just a study. So idea, uh, please and Christina Sensei. Well, I wanted to ask about is that in that power balance, how do the U.S. sanctions affect it in terms of where Chinese business now relies upon? Vietnam and other bases to avoid the US sanctions. Has that strengthened the attraction and leverage for some of the Southeast Asian countries? To what extent are the sanctions shifting that relationship? Okay. Um, for example, as you mentioned, like, can I, can I and reply yes. from my side? Okay. For example, and people is always talking about Vietnam as a kind of China plus one strategies. Plus alpha strategy. However, uh, looking at uh, Vietnam's uh, GDP, it's uh, just a twenty-five percent of Canton provinces. Canton provinces, only twenty-five percent. So thinking about capacity, it's not uh, possible, you know, to accept for an uh, asset and from China. So uh, and the U.S. sanction, of course, and uh, you know, and uh, we announced, and uh, maybe and uh, ASEAN will be used as a kind of hedging region. However, mm -hmm. they cannot absorb all of the things. And ASEAN mm -hmm. is always neutral. They are taking mm -hmm. and hedging, you know, balancing strategies. And mm -hmm. even and in the in COVID situation, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, Moscow and the, you know, and uh, last year's, you know, Ukraine wars, and mm -hmm. ASEAN country is taking the you know, advantage of the balance. <laughs> You know the logistics and the yeah. finance as well. That is the country and the happening. Yeah. So, so the world, mm -hmm. you know, and the gap has increased. The ASEAN country has, you know, taking the advantage of the wisdom to balance. This is actually mm -hmm. happening in this region. In from mm -hmm. business, this is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do this. Um, uh, influence uh, last, so I mean, uh, is it not the short term one or the long term one? So from the British side, how do you think about that? Uh, it's going to be and the long term and uh, you know and perspective. Uh, of course, and uh, you know, uh, depending on the definition of the uh, um, uh, long term and the short term. For business okay, side, yeah. and the short term is just one year or you know just uh, one week. In a long term, the barrier, yeah, yeah. Say, you know, long term is, uh, you know, 10 years and uh, maybe it will and continue at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the ASEAN country will, and as each country and uh, overall ASEAN will, you know, and taking the benefit of the, uh, you know, global turbulence, I think. This uh -huh. is my uh -huh. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. So many IR specialists so talk about the very negative effect so of the uh, US-China rivalry so in Asia. 
but business side, so the ASEAN can uh, can uh, get the chances. So from the from the, the such a strategic turbulence, it's very interesting. Thank you. There's another dimension of heterogeneity among the countries within ASEAN. And one of our audience members, Romain Kaylaud, I'm afraid I'm mispronouncing his name terribly, um, has asked a question about um, how do you assess the political crisis in Myanmar and how it will impact the Japan, Japan ASEAN relationship? Mm -hmm. Do you see the tensions over the crackdown against democracy protests in Myanmar mm -hmm. as posing a difficulty for Japan and also for ASEAN as an organization in heterogeneous. Yeah, so the, from the uh, diplo diplomatic point of view, so the Myanmar issue is a very, very serious challenge to the uh, Japan's foreign policy towards the Southeast Asia and Asia, especially in terms of the human rights issue. So because so Japan used to be very tolerant so against the human rights abuse. So uh, for example, at the Tianmen incident in the 1989, so the Japan, of course, so uh, the provided the sanction toward China, but the lifted so it so in the earliest among the G7 members at that time. So the logic is that. Japan can understand the situations and the position and the interest of the Chinese government. So it's a very tolerant so approach towards uh, uh, the in terms of the human rights issue. So this was the one that was the origin of the Japanese power toward the Asian countries and the developing countries. But so now Japan could not cannot follow cannot follow such approach to the to the Asian countries, to the any countries. So because the the protection, the norm of the protection of human rights is very intense, intensifying. So in the global and in the global community now. And then so Japan is one of the member of the G7. And then so Japan have to keep the such a uh, norm in terms of the human rights. And then so Japan should reconstruct the, the foreign policy in terms of the human rights towards Asia, towards the developing countries. And then so Myanmar issue is very severe. severe. And then so uh, it, this incident so provided Japan with a very serious so opportunity to reconstruct the, the its foreign policy towards uh, and then in terms of the human rights. This is my uh, uh, question and uh, the answer. May I? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, from business side, and my uh, the answer is simply and uh, quite limited. Uh, the reason why, and first of all, the size of the, the Myanmar's economy is and uh, limited, and uh, honest of, honestly speaking, and uh, before the uh, political crisis. And uh, so many Japanese and uh, companies, or and uh, Asians and regional and the company has uh, much interest to invest in uh, Myanmar. However, mm -hmm. there exists even before the political crisis uh, a lot of yeah, and uh, um, uh, um, bribe or you know and the uh, the business is not uh, clear. So it's really hard. And why the uh, real estate prices and the consumer prices have dramatically increased? So, which yeah. means it, it was over expected before the, uh, you know, and political and the crisis, even before the, the political crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, now they need to be and, uh, you know, um, normal and the situation in economic terms. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and, uh, we need to and, uh, pay attention to things. First of all, you know, natural resources. Mm -hmm. On the, yeah, and the Myanmar's and, uh, you know, site, Western part of Southeast Asia, they have the you know, oil and gas and the natural resources existed. So uh, we need to and uh, discuss how to handle this is. And also mm -hmm. logistic issues from China to Myanmar. So if the uh, China can access to the Myanmar directly, so they can mm -hmm. avoid uh, Malacca and the Straits. 
So this might be an affected to the business. So these two things might be a major concern, but it may take say a longer term and a business perspective, you know, like at least 10 years to develop the infrastructure from mainland China. Because in the southern part of mainland China is a, a kind of a forest and how to develop, you know, um, civil engineering perspective point of view, it's really, really difficult. So uh, I mean, it may take time. However, we need to and uh, thinking about and uh, how to you know and hedge you know logistic issue and the natural issue. This might be a, a new discussion, uh, not just uh, uh, from the political crisis, but also the Myanmar's and the geopolitical and the geoeconomic and the position. This is my understanding. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting about your comment is that from a business perspective, it was a little bit of a cooling down of optimism about Myanmar, but it was already a small stake in the region. Mm. But Oba Sensei has told us the Japanese government may take a new strong foreign policy position. Mm -hmm. And that may come up against some of those business approaches. If there mm. actually were to be a call for stronger sanctions against Myanmar, that would go against mm -hmm. the normal ASEAN principle of non-interference. And so I think there could be tensions. I don't see Japan taking a policy like the United States where it tries to externalize its own right. sanctions with secondary sanctions on other mm -hmm. countries. But there is this issue about whether Japan can have a stronger human rights oriented foreign policy while still having deep engagement with oh. us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yes. So because, so uh, even Myanmar, so do, uh, do not seem to, so, uh, uh, run away, run away from the run, run, uh, the uh, get rid of the ASEAN port. I mean, so then the ASEAN countries, so a uh, list of the ASEAN countries seem to continue the engagement towards Myanmar. So because so uh, to, to keep the ASEAN ten, uh, the unity of ASEAN is a very uh, the politically very important for them and for Japan. So to continue the commitment to this Myanmar, politi is politically so very important, even though the size of the business is very small. And then, so it's a little bit a uh, 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 gap. So between the perspective of the politics and the business, it's very important. Interesting. We have time for one last question. I'd like, I see a thumbs up. I'm not sure if a thumbs up is a question. <laughs> G Mao, uh, one of our visiting uh, scholars. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I hope to ask uh, Mr. Hey, Ms. Hey, since uh, following Christian, uh, Christian's question, I mean, given another maybe 10 years uh, when the US Japan led um, um, supply chain is ready. I think maybe it will have a major impact on the ASEAN China economic cooperation. Uh, at least it will be another very important alternative. Uh, what, what do you, what's your assessment? Because this year, sorry, at one, this year, many Chinese companies already complained to me that they are losing a lot of beers to the Southeast Asian countries. I think this is one of the effect, impact of the, uh, the American uh, US supply chain initiative. Mm. So maybe, so it's, uh, I I want to Hemi Sensei to Hemi San to answer this question. So, so because from the from the uh, my point of view, I'm so doubtful how the such a U.S. Uh, initiative affect the behavior of the business sector. So and then so I I really want to know the the Hemi Sensei's comment on this issue. So how the policy uh, uh, change the behavior of the business sector. May I, Christina Sensei? Yeah, yes. Okay. Please. Okay, I'm sorry. And the, uh, I try to end quickly answer to this question. First of all, and uh, Global West and the US especially don't know what is currently happening in this and the ASEAN country because then their concern is not, it's focusing on China. 
the actually, and China is backed by ASEAN. ASEAN is by China. This is a reality. So, and uh, to make the understanding you know, on American audience, it's a faster step because not knowing what is happening is, you know, um, almost a uh, uh, disaster yeah, to develop the you know, strategy or the policy. This is the first question. And the second question is, people is always thinking, uh, talking about the US-China rivalry. And however, it's not uh, covering all of the industry. They are um, uh, competing each other within the uh, strategic and the product. And a commodity product is not the an area to coverage it. So we need to focus on the strategies and the co and, and components. Sometimes the Japanese and uh, you know policymaker or you know um, uh, Japanese and the company is too much fear about the uh, um, uh, economic security issues. However, the issue is focusing on the strategic area. So for for example, the semiconductors or future the advanced material and uh, alliance and will be needed. You know because and uh, top notch and high quality advanced material is not made and from China. It can be achieved from the alliance between Japan and the US. This can be and uh, imported uh, to in an ASEAN region. This can be you know and formulated the new alliance strategy. That is a core and a part of the uh, um, uh, new alliance and the strategy by industry or by product basis. That kind of discussion is very much important in the two focus and uh, you know when we're talking about this issue. When the high level discussion might be okay, but it's over. Now we need to focus on what product, which product, and when is the exit timeline. This is very much important to discuss. Mm. How I and uh, you know answer rightly to uh, Mao sounds and question. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a fascinating overview. The business will always find a way. And as you say, there are many commodities where there is a robust business going on between the US and China, as well as in ASEAN. And so we should not assume that all of the bad news about limited sanctions in one product means that economics has been shut down. Um, thanks so much for helping us understand the way that firms are building on the resources and ingenuity and entrepreneurship of this region and managing to come up with a way to balance between great powers and still do good business. It's really um, exciting to hear about these opportunities and how the region has shown its resilience. Mm -hmm. And thank you both for attending to the China perspective the Japanese perspective, adding in both government and business. Um, it's really been a comprehensive overview and a treat for us all. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.